my pleasure to introduce our guests for this evening, James Shore, who will be speaking with us about the new art of agile development. Back in 2007, uh, seems bizarre to me that that was almost 15 years ago, uh, James and Shane Warden published the art of agile development expressly to help others master the fundamental human art of agile development. A lot has happened in the world of agile since that book was written. This year, James published a brand new, thoroughly updated version. In it, he provides no-nonsense advice on agile adoption, planning, development, delivery, and management taken from over two decades of agile experience. Tonight, James will share the first chapter of the book with us and offer an opportunity to discuss what agile means to us, how that might align with our organizations, and what it looks like at its best. Over to you, James. All right, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here. So I'm gonna read from the first chapter of the book. Uh, chapter one, what is Agile? Agile is everywhere and paradoxically nowhere. In the 20 years after the Agile freight train roared into software developers consciousness, the number of teams, a number of companies calling themselves Agile increased by orders of magnitude. The number of teams actually taking an Agile approach to their work, not so much. Agile, the easily repeated name, is enormously successful. The ideas behind Agile, well, most of them are ignored. Let's fix that. Agile's genesis. In the 1990s, software development was believed to be in crisis. They actually called it that, the software crisis. Software projects were over budget, late, didn't meet requirements, and according to the oft-quoted and ominously named chaos report, nearly one-third of them were canceled outright. Agile wasn't a response to this crisis, far from it. Agile was a response to the response. To bring software development under control, big organizations had created highly detailed processes that defined exactly how software was to be created. Everything was tightly controlled so that no mistakes could be made, in theory anyway. First business analysts would interview stakeholders and document the system requirements. Next, software architects would read the requirements documents and create detailed design documents specifying every component of the system and how they related to one another. Then programmers can, would convert the design documents to code. In some organizations, this was considered low skill work, just a mechanical translation exercise. Meanwhile, test leads would use the same documents to generate test plans, and when coding was done, armies of QA personnel would manually follow those test plans and report variances as defects. After each phase, everything would be carefully documented, reviewed, and signed off. These phase-based approaches came to be called waterfall development or phase gate development. If they sound like a ridiculous, stra ridiculous straw man, well, consider yourself fortunate. Not every company used a document-heavy phase-based approach in the 90s, but it was widely recognized as a logical and sensible way to work. Of course you needed to define requirements, then design, then implement, then test. Of course you needed to document every phase. This was discipline. This was engineering. How else could you possibly succeed? Born out of crisis. Big companies define their processes in excruciating detail. Roles, responsibilities, document templates, modeling languages, change control boards, every aspect of development was strictly defined and controlled. If a project didn't succeed, and according to the chaos report, less than one sixth of them did, it was because the process needed more detail, more documents, more sign offs. This resulted in a massive amount of documentation. Martin Fowler called it the almighty thud. This wasn't a great way to work. It was bureaucratic and dehumanizing. Skill didn't seem to matter as much as adherence to process. Programmers felt they were interchangeable cogs in an impersonal machine. It didn't even work all that well. So several people created simpler, slimmer, and less prescriptive methods for developing software. They were called lightweight methods in contrast to the heavyweight methods used by big companies. These new methods had names like adaptive software development, crystal, feature-driven development, dynamic systems development method, extreme programming, and Scrum. By the late 90s, these methods were attracting serious attention. Extreme programming in particular saw an explosion of grassroots interest among programmers. In 2001, 17 of the lightweight methodology proponents met at a ski resort in Utah to discuss unifying their efforts. The Agile Manifesto. I personally didn't expect this particular group of people to ever agree on anything substantive. 
Alistair Coburn said later. And in fact, after two days, they accomplished only two things, the name Agile and a statement of four values, see figure 1-1 or agilemanifesto.org. During the following months, over email, they hashed out 12 accompanying principles. This was the Agile Manifesto. It changed the world. So, as Alistair went on to say, they did agree on something substantive after all. But there was no unified Agile method. There never has been and never will be. Agile is three things, the name, the values, and the principles. That's it. It's not something you can do. It's a philosophy, a way of thinking about software development. You can't use Agile or do Agile. You can only be Agile or not. If your teams embody the Agile philosophy, then they're Agile. If they don't, they're not. The essence of Agile. Martin Fowler has made a career out of turning complicated software topics into well-considered, even-handed explanations. His explanation of the essence of, a soft, of Agile software development is one of the best. Agile development is adaptive rather than predictive, people-oriented rather than process-oriented. Martin Fowler. Adaptive rather than predictive. Remember the chaos report, which said that only one-sixth of software projects were successful? It had a very specific definition of success. Success, the project is completed on time and on budget with all the features and functions as originally specified. Challenged, the project is completed and operational, but over budget, over the time estimate, and offers fewer features and functions than originally specified. Impaired, the project is canceled at some point during the development cycle. These definitions illustrate the predictive mindset perfectly. They're all about conformance to plan. If you did what you said you were going to do, you were successful. If you didn't, you weren't. Easy. It makes sense at first, but look closer. There's something missing. As Ryan Nelson wrote in CIO Magazine, projects that were found to meet all of the traditional criteria for success, time, budget, and specifications may still be failures in the end because they fail to appeal to the intended users or because they ultimately fail to add much value to the business. Similarly, projects considered failures according to traditional IT metrics may wind up being successes because despite cost, time, or specification problems, the system is loved by its target audience or provides unexpected value. Agile teams define success as delivering value, not conforming to a plan. In fact, truly agile teams actively look for opportunities to increase value by changing their plans. Look back at the manifesto. Take a moment to really study the agile values and principles. How many relate to delivering valuable software and adapting to feedback? People-oriented rather than process-oriented. Heavyweight processes tried to prevent errors by carefully defining every aspect of software development. By putting the smarts in the process, individual skill became less important. In theory, you could apply the same process over and over with different people and get the same results. Come to think of it, they kind of did, just not the results they wanted. Agile says people are the most important factor in software development success, not just their skills, but all aspects of their humanity, how well team members work together, how many distractions they encounter, how safe they are to speak up, and whether they're motivated by their work. Agile teams have a process, every team does, even if it's implicit, but the process is in service of the humans not the other way around. And agile teams are in charge of their own process. When they think of a better way of working, they change it. Look at the manifesto again. Which values and principles relate to putting people first? Why agile won? In the first 10 years after the manifesto, agile faced enormous criticism. It was undisciplined, critics said. It could never work. Another 10 years after that, the critics were silent. Agile was everywhere, at least in name. Heavyweight waterfall methods were effectively dead. Some younger programmers have trouble believing anybody ever could have worked that way. It's not that phase-based processes are inherently broken. They have their flaws, sure, but if you keep them slim and operate in a well-understood domain, waterfall-style methods can work. The problem was the heavyweight approaches big companies used. Ironically, the processes designed to prevent problems actually caused many of the problems organizations were seeing. It's very difficult to imagine how software will work before you actually use it, and it's even harder to think of absolutely everything your software needs to do. This is doubly true for people who aren't actively involved with software development. 
As a result, it's critically important to get working software in front of people as soon as possible. You need to get feedback about what's missing or wrong, then change your plans based on what you learn. As the manifesto says, uh, working software is the primary measure of progress. Learning and responding to change are at the heart of what Agile is all about. Those heavyweight processes put so much emphasis on process controls and documentation and sign-offs, they incurred a huge amount of delay and overhead. They took years to produce working software, and they had nothing concrete to show until near the end. Instead of welcoming change, they actively worked to prevent change. They actually had a dedicated part of the process, the change control board, whose primary purpose was to say no to change requests, or more accurately, yes, but it will cost you. All of this added up to projects that spent years in development before they had anything to show. When they did, it was too late and too expensive to make changes. They ultimately shipped software that didn't do what customers needed. Although there are a variety of approaches to Agile, and some of them are more about co-opting a popular name than following the actual philosophy, one thing they all have in common is a focus on making progress visible and allowing stakeholders to make course corrections as they go. This seems like a small thing, but it's incredibly powerful. It's why we no longer hear about the software crisis. Software is still late. It's still over budget. But Agile teams show progress with working software, not documents right from the beginning, and that's huge. There's more to, providing, more to Agile than just providing visibility, but this one thing, this was enough. It's why everybody wanted Agile. Why Agile works. Agile's first breakout success was extreme programming, XP, a method with the slogan, embrace change. XP mixed a healthy dose of philosophizing about software development with a pragmatic emphasis on making a difference. As the preface to the first XP book states, in short, XP promises to reduce project risk, improve responsiveness to business changes, improve productivity throughout the life of a system, and add fun to building software and teams, all at the same time. Really, quit laughing. Extreme Programming Explained, first edition. Some people did laugh but others tried it and they found that contrary to common wisdom about how software development was supposed to work, XP really did everything it promised. And so despite the laughter, XP thrived and Agile along with it. XP was the original poster child of Agile, donating a backbone of ideas and terminology that are still in use today. But the strength of the Agile community is that it has always been a big tent. Agile isn't limited to any one method. It's constantly expanding to include new people and ideas. Lean software development, Scrum, Kanban, Lean startup, DevOps, and many, many more have all contributed to what people think of Agile today. Agile is defined by the manifesto, but the manifesto is just the starting point. Agile works because people make it work. They take Agile's ideas, adapt them to their situation, and never stop improving. Why Agile fails. Agile started as a grassroots movement. Its initial success was largely driven by programmers seeking better results and better quality of life. As that success grew, Agile's momentum shifted from the underlying ideas to hype. Rather than saying, let's get better results by adapting our plans and putting people first, organization leaders started saying, everybody's talking about Agile. Get me some Agile. The thing is, there is no Agile to go get. It's just a bunch of ideas. There are specific Agile approaches, such as extreme programming and Scrum, that will tell you how to be Agile, but you still have to be on board with the underlying philosophy. And for a lot of organizations, that underlying philosophy, adapting plans and putting people first, is really, really foreign. Uh, then I tell a little story about cargo cults. Uh, the tragedy of the cargo cult is its adherence to the superficial outward signs of some idea combined with the ignorance of how that idea actually works. In the story, in the sidebar I skipped, the islanders replicated all the elements of cargo drops, the airstrip, the tower, the headphones, but didn't understand the vast infrastructure that enabled airplanes to arrive. The same tragedy occurs with Agile. People want Agile's cargo, better results, more visibility, fewer business failures but they don't understand the underlying philosophy and often wouldn't agree with it, even if they did. They want to buy Agile, but you can't buy an idea. What they can buy is the outward signs of Agile, stand-up meetings, stories, tools, certifications. There's lots of stuff labeled Agile and plenty of people, 
eager to sell it to you. It's often sold as enterprise grade, which is a way of saying, don't worry, you won't have to change. Uncomfortable ideas like adaptive planning and people-centric are ignored. And that's how you get a cargo cult. All the activity, none of the results. The agile part is missing. At my old company, they wasted a huge number of man hours in meetings. Agile cost an entire team, 30 plus of people their jobs as they produced almost nothing for almost a year. All Agile means is developers get shafted when the project changes the day before delivery. Real comments about Agile from around the web. The name Agile is everywhere. The ideas of Agile aren't. It's become self-perpetuating. For many, the only Agile they know is cargo cult Agile. It's time to fix that. In the rest of this book, I'll show you how to apply Agile ideas for real. Keep an eye out for the cargo cult Agilists who have infiltrated the book. You can also find them in the index. They'll show you what not to do. Ready? Let's go. Holy cow, James, that is a, a fantastic first chapter. And I don't want you to stop because I want to find out what comes in chapter two. I guess I'm going to have to, uh, I guess I'm going to have to um, buy that book. Uh, for those of you that are new to, uh, that's okay. That, that's, that's great. For those of you that are new to Agile TO, my name's Jeff, uh, and I'm going to uh, facilitate some Q&A right now of James. I'm talking for a minute here to give him a chance to have a little sip of water or beer or whatever it happens to be. Um, but if you have questions, put your hand up or uh, throw your question in the chat window. You can send it directly to me or you can public, uh, you can say, show it up so everybody uh, can ask a question. There are a few that have already come in from folks who've obviously been here before. Um, so we'll get into those. But the first one, actually, Tom, uh, I was hoping that you, uh, you could start us off with a question. Yeah, I, uh, I I love that. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this is uh, this is great stuff, and and I think all of us that are part of the agile community are familiar with a lot of the themes that you've introduced. Uh, the the one that really struck me, I, I actually started working on, on a book uh, uh, with uh, with a colleague of mine a few years ago. That uh, the working title was Cargo Cult Agile, and it was really the whole thing was all about. Uh, just what you've articulated here, where it's this this intense desire on the part of enterprises to put in place the trappings of agile without the underlying culture and mindset and you know all all the things that you've articulated as being important for it, and and we we were stopped in our tracks when someone said, it's not cool to use that term. Mm -hmm that it's, it's somehow there's, there's racist overtones or something of that nature. And, and, and my, my colleague and I just struggled so much with trying to articulate that notion without using that term. And I just wondered if, that had, if you'd been confronted with that or if it was something you grappled with at all. I mean, it was something that I was concerned about because we're not actually talking about the real religions in the Melanesian islands that the the term comes from. Right. Um, the, uh, uh, the the John from uh, rich, uh, the John from religion, but um, the the term is so evocative and mm -hmm. it's so apt that what I decided to do, I had an extensive review period because, of course, I do take an agile approach with with lots and lots of feedback. And we had um, oh, uh, over a hundred people on the review list and dozens of people who submitted comments on, on all aspects of the book. And what I decided to do is I was gonna put this in here and then if anybody raised a concern, I would take it out and I would try to figure something out. And nobody did. Uh, instead, people raised a concern that other people would raise concerns, uh, exactly as you have just now. Um, <laughs> But nobody actually said, no, this offends me as, you know, a Melanesian who's, who is a member of this religion. So I uh, decided to put it anyway, although I was a little concerned that it would, um, it, it would cause a problem. Um, but also, uh, you know, the, the phrase is one I brought up it, when, when the first book came out, um, it was something I, it was a sort of a bit of bonus material I wrote on the website for the first book. And it, it resonated really strongly with people at the time back in 2007 or 2008, whenever it was that I put that up. And um, I've since given some talks about it and those have all landed really well. So I thought it was such good material and it it's so true to how things are really working. Um, and it gave me the opportunity to tell all these awesome little stories throughout the book that, uh, 
that I had to I had to keep it in. Good stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Mara, you had a question as well. Um, I don't know if uh, if you wanted to ask it, um, but I'm going to just start, and you can maybe tell me if I get it wrong. James, um, wondering because you're not the only one, Mara, who asked it, but you asked it kind of the best. Um, is is how did you write the book in the first place? How long did you take to write the book? How did you um, how did you come up with the topics? Um, did you apply, you, you mentioned applying some agile principles to writing the book, wondering if you can talk about how you did that and how you found the time to be able to put these thoughts into, uh, into the book. Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, this was the second edition of the book. Um, so, uh, which, and I was, actually, I have a physical copy right here. This is what it looks like. Um, thank you. Uh, so this is the second edition. I think Jeff may have just held up the first edition. The main difference between them is this one has a goldfish. So it's obviously better. I don't have a goldfish. Yeah, see, there's no goldfish on Jeff's copy. So um, also the, the tree has grown towards the light. If you look carefully, you'll see that it's, it's it growing towards the light. Uh, the, uh, uh, the first edition took my co-author and I, Shane Warden and myself uh, 18 months from concept to cash, so they say, uh, and nine months of that was full-time work. Obviously, the second edition would be faster. Uh, also, uh, Shane wasn't available, which um, you, you might be surprised to learn that working with a co-author does not necessarily make you faster. It get, improves the quality of the result, but it doesn't make you faster. So I was thinking that the second edition, being a second edition, will go a lot faster. And uh, like I said, Shane wasn't available to work uh, as closely with me as he was on the first edition. It took um, about 18 months and about seven or 15 months of that was full-time work. So it, it took longer. And I ended up rewriting every single stinking word and adding a hundred pages to the book. So, um, uh, the, the answer is, is that I was able to do it because I'm a consultant, I work for myself. And um, during the pandemic, I had a lot of free time. So I, uh, I just spent that time working on the book. And then mechanically, I wrote it in a, in a markup language called ASCII doc and um, wrote software to translate it to HTML for publishing on my website. For Very cool. Um one of the things you talked about was that um, early on, the XP tools, techniques, approaches, uh, principles, and values um, were, were very prevalent. And in, in recent years, you know, we've seen the, the scrums and safes of the world um, really take over from a marketing perspective and a popularity perspective. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or comments on what what we're missing as uh, as we talk about things like safe and scrum that uh, that that the XP principles and practices and values um, maybe aren't don't have um, or aren't represented in some of these other frameworks. Yeah, so the book is uh, is sort of oriented around the agile fluency model, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. But the agile fluency model describes uh, uh, multiple zones of of fluency for agile practice. And um, they are grouped into, um, let's see if I can find a, a picture to share. They're grouped, uh, as I said, into, grouped into four zones, uh, focusing, delivering, optimizing, and strengthening. And each of these zones can be pursued independently and you can achieve fluency in any of these zones. It's not a maturity model. Scrum-like practices are very much in the focusing zone. And XP is something that's in both the focusing and delivering zones. And then something like Lean Startup is pretty much in the optimizing zone and with combined with XP as it was when it was first created at, uh, at uh, IM View, uh, it's focusing, delivering and optimizing zones. So I think there is a lot of value in just achieving fluency yeah, in any of these zones. If you can get fluency with Scrum in the focusing zone, there's a lot of benefits to that, but I don't think it's sustainable. I think that after a couple of years, you do start to see issues with uh, difficulty sustaining your ability to develop your software. And then typically seven plus or minus two years, your, your software is, gets to the point where it has to have a rewrite. 
may be faster. Um, as for safe, I actually have a whole sidebar on that. And if we've got time, Jeff, I, I wouldn't mind reading it. Sure. A couple more questions maybe, and, uh, and, and we can come back to that. Um, okay. I, I suspect there'd, there'd be uh, an interest in that. Um, just piggybacking on that, uh, um, there's a question out there, you know, just in response to your answer, are you seeing any resurgence in XP practices, given the focus that's recently come out on DevOps or DevSecOps or DevSecBizOps, or as many acronyms as you can cram into Dev and Ops? Um, are you seeing a resurgence anyway in any of the XP uh, practices? Um, yes and no. Uh, you know, people were, I remember people saying in the early 2000s, uh, what's going to, you know, what's going to happen with Agile? What's going to happen with XP? And uh, there was a sort of common sentiment that uh, Agile's, the name is going to go away. That didn't turn out to be true. XP, the name is going to go away. That did pretty much turn out to be true. And uh, instead, it's just going to be called software development. And to a large extent, I think that has happened, but not as well as I would have hoped, uh, in that um, continuous integration as, a, as an idea what came from extreme programming. User stories came from extreme programming. Um, the, a lot of the ideas in XP are still out in the world. Test-driven development, of course, came from extreme programming. Now, people aren't all doing test-driven development, but unit testing using JUnit, which Kent Beck created, along with Eric Gamma, that's very much uh, out there in the world. So I would love to see XP take uh, more of a resurgent in some of the rigor of its practices, but a lot of those ideas are still out there. And I would say that DevOps, depending on how you define the term, as with so many things in Agile, um, is again sort of XP, XP ideas brought into the cloud area. And we do have actually a whole chapter on DevOps where we take that sort of talk about, well, what, how do we apply these XP ideas to the cloud area? And that's where we put our stuff on, uh, for example, um, building for operation and, and so forth. So the, the other question that's in the background here that I, I'm going to skip over and I'm going to apologize, two people asked a question along the same ideas about using agile words to describe the waterfall or phase gate process of I'm going to do a requirements gathering sprint and then I'm going to do a design sprint. I'm going to skip over that question because as, as much as those two people would like to hear it, I'm getting more and more pings about, please, please read us the section on safe. <laughs> um, so I think we'd love to hear that. Um, we are at, at 6.30 though, so if anybody does have to drop off, um, thank you. You can always listen to the recording on the YouTube channel. There is a link in the chat window as well where you can access the Agile TO feedback survey. Love to get your feedback on topics that you're interested in and what you thought of this session. So please leave some feedback uh, that's in there. But James, if you have some time and are willing to stick around, I think we'd love to hear what you wrote about SAFE. Sure, I would be happy to. That's so this great. comes. This comes from, I believe it's chapter six, which is called Scaling Agility. It talks about multiple aspects of scaling agility. And uh, one is scaling your team's capability. The other is scaling uh, how teams work together. And um, I talk about uh, horizontal scaling uh, using the ideas, ideas similar to what you find in this book, team topologies. I talk about vertical scaling using, um, using a large scale scrum or less and uh, fast fluid scaling technology, which by the way, I've had the chance to do uh, now. I didn't when I had written the book uh, and it is fantastic. Um, uh, you can find that at fastagile.io if you're curious. And then at the very end, I have this sidebar called, uh, what about safe? So uh, keep in mind that this comes at the end of a whole bunch of conversation about what you can do. Uh, what about safe? Safe, scaled Agile framework is a popular approach to scaling Agile. Unfortunately, I've yet to see it work well. Companies tend to adopt it with great fanfare, only to silently drop it several years later. I'm not sure why that is. Critics of Safe claim it's not really Agile, and it does have a certain whiff of process over people and prediction over adaptability. I suspect the real reason Safe fails, though, is twofold. First, Safe emphasizes being enterprise friendly, which in the organizations I've seen results in insufficient organizational investment in agile ideas. Organizations tend to stick with their existing top-down command and control predictive mindset. Second, SAFE has very little to say about how teams coordinate, the hardest and most, most crucial problem in scaling. 
Prior to Save 5, it suggested feature teams, same as less, but it was extremely wishy-washy about it and didn't include the details less provides to make them work. Save 5, released in February 2021, replaced feature teams with a discussion of team topologies, which at least provides more detail. But that's a horizontal scaling approach, which is a step backward. It requires very careful attention to the design of team responsibilities, which again, SAFE doesn't mention, let alone help with. SAFE's SOP to team coordination is an every few months program increment planning session, also known as big room planning. It's predictive, not adaptive, extremely labor intensive and draining, and it doesn't work well with remote teams. Although some people do praise its ability to get teams on the same page, my experience is that it's the first thing companies drop. Unfortunately, there's not much else to safe. So once PI planning is gone, you're left with a bunch of teams with limited ability to coordinate. All in all, safe pays lip service to a mishmash of agile ideas without seeming to fully understand them. I don't recommend it. A conversation for another time, James, is I'd love to hear how Dean reacted to, uh, to what you wrote in there. Um, I will say that what you wrote aligns with, uh, with my expectations as well, and we're seeing some applause uh, coming through for what you did right. You're running a book club on this. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, every week, uh, every Friday, except uh, in the holidays, so we're going to take the last two weeks of December off. Uh, we are taking a, a section, a practice from the book, uh, and... Uh, discussing it both on my Discord, which you can find at jameshore.com slash s slash aoad2 discord. That's aod2 for Art of Agile Development 2 uh, discord. Um, so every day I'm posting a discussion prompt and people are discussing it there. And then on Fridays, I have a Zoom conversation uh, 45 minutes from 8 to 8.45 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, we've had some really great conversations there and I highly recommend you check it out. And um, it's also available on YouTube if, uh, if, you don't, if you're unable to be in the session. The next one is going to be on uh, team rooms and team collaboration with a lot of emphasis on remote teams. It uh, should be really good. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. That's this Friday, 8 o'clock. Um, and is, so there a is there a website? How do, I, I missed how we joined that book club. Uh, if you go to the Discord, you'll, you'll see lots of information. Or uh, let me just go ahead and paste the link in the chat. Um, it's in my event calendar on my website, which is, and this is the actual link to the uh, event calendar page. That's wonderful, James. Listen, I think we could keep this conversation going all night, but as a quick talk format, um, we have reached our time. Folks, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you, James, so much for sharing that first chapter of the book with us and whetting our appetite for, for more. Um, I, I know that it's been in my cart now and on Amazon for a while, and I'm um, probably going to be checking out as soon as we're done with this. Folks, make sure if you have a moment, you fill out the feedback form. We love to get your thoughts on, on tonight as well as uh, other future sessions. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all of the organizers and James, mostly thank you to you uh, for sharing that first chapter with us tonight and then indulging us with some questions. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.